Okay, welcome everyone. I am so thankful that you're here today. Um, what we'd like you to do at this time to get started with our high school remote teaching and learning effective and best practices, we would like you to go to joinpd.com and then enter the code of CBZXM. Okay. So I'll just wait till everybody's in there and then I can kind of see where you're at. And I see that you're actively joining. So thank you so much for doing that. I greatly appreciate it. Okay. So we've got eight students in so far. I think we had about 10 of you. So in case if you're just not quite there, try again to go to joinpd.com and then enter the code of CBZXM. Okay, now what I'd like to share with each of you today is that I have best practices that I'd like to share with you that I've been working with many high schools around the nation. And we have really found some effective strategies that are really working well for us. And I can't wait to learn from each of you because I know that you've got strategies as well that are working well for you. So we wanna to learn together with this. So I just wanted to say welcome everybody. My name is Naomi Harm. I'm joining you from beautiful Cape Creek, Arizona today. I live about 40 miles just north of Phoenix, Arizona. And Phoenix is one of our largest cities, um, one of the top, you could say the top six in the nation. And we have a very large population, but I live in an area that's more rural. We only have about 5,000 people that live in our area and I absolutely love it. I'm very passionate about women in leadership and provide a lot of strategies to school districts on best practices when it comes to teaching and learning, whether it's online, face-to-face, -face, or remote learning. But I'm very passionate about STEM. STEM in general was science, technology, engineering, the arts, and mathematics. So I will be integrating some of that into today's presentation. For any follow-up, please feel free at any given time. You can just go to my website at naomiharm.org or email me at naomi at naomiharm.org or you can always follow me on Twitter and we can continue the conversation. And my name on Twitter is just Naomi Harm. But I wanna check in with each of you today. And so before we begin this activity, this is your stress check. I wanna know kind of where you're at and how you're feeling with new things. So what I have is I basically have a slide here that kind of gives an overview. But before I make it interactive, I kind of want you to think about how is your stress in your workload with your family, with your life, designing lessons. And by doing that, I'm gonna instantly give you a new prompt right away. So once I add that, that refreshes your screen. Now what you'll be able to do is that you should be able to have a little blue circle at the very bottom, bottom left corner that you should be able to drag and drop onto the screen if it will work. We'll see if it's gonna work for you today. Yep, some of you have already added that in, which is great. Okay, wonderful, I've got nine out of 10 responses so far. And what that helps me as a teacher right away even though you're not seeing what others are responding to, I can instantly showcase to you, I can show responses and these are anonymous. So I've got about half of you saying, I'm in a good space right now. The other half you're saying, you know what? There is something kind of bothering me. I've got a lot on my plate. I've got a lot of unknowns going back into school for this next year. I'm trying to balance family, trying to balance work, trying to balance life situations. So instantly I as a teacher can see this, but I can also turn it on to share with my students. And if I had someone that was really on that far right, that is really having basically an emotional breakdown saying, I cannot find appropriate balance. I would know who that student is and I can personally reach out to that student. And that's, that's what I love about this program. I can still do everything anonymously and I can instantly interact with that child or that teacher that I'm working with. I could have had you sign in today and then I would have known whose every email was right away and I could have responded back. But I wanted to keep this anonymous so that each of you could see um, what was taking place. So thank you so much for sharing that. So we kind of have you about in the middle and then in a good space. So that's good. I'm glad to see that. Okay. 
Our biggest uh, point of view that I'll be sharing with you today is that our purpose for learning is that we're going to be looking at the current research of how and why our Generation Z and Generation Alpha students learn best. Our Generation Z students are our kiddos that are about in about nine years old all the way up through high school and just entering the workforce and finishing college. Our Generation Alpha students are our students that are considered the littles. Those are our students that are in pre-K, kindergarten, first and second grade, and our generation of students that are still being born yet. But we're going to be discussing what's really working well with remote teaching and learning with our students and with our teachers. And then I'm going to be modeling some really um, interactive participation techniques to empower you to engage in more collaborative remote learning activities for your high school kids. Because I know working even at that high school level, it's hard sometimes to get those kids engaged in the learning. And if we go back to school and if we start all online, some kids are not really actively engaged. So we've got to find some ways to get those kiddos involved. So these strategies for the next section, you can modify to your liking. You could take just one or two ideas and run with it. But I will be giving a lot of ideas, so I don't want to overwhelm. Pick one or two that works for you. Now, here's a thinking question, too. So before you respond and I refresh the screen, I really need to hear your collective voice of what is working with remote teaching and learning strategies that are working well for you or your students. But then I also want you to identify two or one or two remote learning areas you would like to know more about that you could improve your teaching and learning scenarios. So because of that, I'm going to add a new prompt and that new prompt will be the same type of prompt that I just shared with you, but you will have the opportunity to reflect as a question set. Okay, so now that you have the new page reflected, now you'll be able to see a text box on the side that you can actually enter your information quickly. So take the moment and just share, what are, what are two remote teaching and learning strategies that are working well? And then also what are some areas of improvement that you'd like to be part of? Or something that you've been wanting to ask but haven't gotten answers to your questions yet? Okay. I've got some great responses coming in. I'll showcase those in just a minute, but I want to give you some think time and processing time. Again, love to learn with you. What are one or two things that are really going well with remote teaching and learning? And then maybe something you've been thinking about that you want to learn more about with remote teaching and learning. Please share those ideas with me. Okay. And as those responses are coming in, I'm going to showcase just a few that have come in so far, but that means that you can still continue to add. So let me show some responses that are coming in. Some of you are sharing with me right away asynchronous learning um, using screen recordings for content distribution. Some of you are saying that that's really been helpful. Gamified activities, essay feedback, choice board, and a variety of activities. Uh, presenting new information is something I'd like to get better at, somebody has said. Absolutely. And again, start with smaller pieces of information and then to improve that practice. I love that you're taking that leap of faith and taking that risk. Having students work collaboratively and gamifying the lesson activities. Absolutely. Any time that we can have students pair up as dynamic duos or transformative trios, it makes the learning more fun and interactive but we do need to allow for space for some children that would just like to have some singleton time alone. I do understand that as well too. Okay, so again, once again, you are adding those contributions to thinking about best practices for remote teaching and learning. Okay, and um, you did share with me um, some, some ideas that I've read back to you. Those are some activities that have come in 
The choice boards also, some of you brought choice boards. Some of you have also broken down information into smaller chunks. You know what? Less is more. You are spot on with that. That will truly differentiate the instruction too. Hyperdocs, absolutely. Um, for weekly choice and allowing them to work at their own pace, wonderful. Flipgrid, oh my goodness. Isn't Flipgrid better than chocolate? I too, I love it, I love it. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. So all kinds of ideas are coming in, okay. So I'm going to hide those responses at this time. It's going to make, bring us back to our main presentation slide there. So thank you so much for adding your responses. I have more responses coming in. Again, if you've just joined us, you can join this session by going joinpd.com. And then up in the corner, you can see the code, which is CVZXM to join in on the presentation. Well, let's learn a little bit about Generation Z. Those are the kids right now in your classrooms that are from about third grade to high school or so, or fourth grade to high school, and a little bit more about those Generation Alpha kids. Now, some things that we have really learned from the research, which has been amazing, and if you would like to know more about this research, it can be found at McCrindle Research. And this is where I get all of my statistics, my data feedback, my different types of charts that I collect my data from to present my presentations from, because I wanna give you the most relevant information that is out there today on these kiddos. But these kids, again, like I said, they are your upper elementary, they are your middle school, your secondary kids, and some of them are now entering the workforce. They are the most diverse population of students on our planet right now. And what's really interesting is that these kids truly trust their peers more than us as adult learners or their elders. And I find that fascinating because we know that some of their peers can give them misinformation. So this is why we need to model and guide appropriate strategies even more so during this whole remote learning um, that we're currently in. These kids are so driven though. They're so driven that they want to change the world and they have this social cause initiative on their forefront and they have this entrepreneurial spirit. And when I've actually interviewed high school students and according which matches with the research, about anywhere from 74 to 82% of children want to start their own business of some sort someday. That's what I find amazing. These kids also demand transparency. They want to be part of the solution. And boy, have we seen this during our pandemic. The kids have come out in the droves by creating creative PPE gear. So from masks to adaptive pieces to make the shields for our doctors and our nurses, they're actually strategizing what type of PPE do we need even in our classrooms to better prepare? And we should be tapping into this young mindset to help us keep us safe and to find these incredible solutions. Now, I have a quick video clip, but because of our time today, we're a little bit stretched. So I wanted to still mention it. It's something that just totally reiterates just the previous slide, and it's called What You Z Is What You Get. And this is uh, created by, it's called Roth, or Roth um, Staffing Companies, and they've done a nice job pulling that research together about really documenting what those first, second, or third years in the workforce are looking like at a company perspective um, of what Generation Z looks like, how they different from the millennials, and what the workplace environment looks like. So if you'd like more, tap into this presentation afterwards. You'll get into this video clip. Now, when I continue on with this, this is what's fascinating. When we continue on and look at our future workforce, what's it gonna look like for these Generation Z students? We now know that they have been totally exposed to a pandemic that none of us have ever experienced before. And then this type of learning situation is going to catapult their thinking, their learning, and their problem solving into the future. And because of that, um, this is how things are going to change. 40% of the jobs that currently exist right now are going to be obsolete by 2030. I mean, that's wildly thinking, isn't it? That means that a lot of the things that we do are going to be replaced by some type of computer science or an algorithm strategy or a robotic force of some sort. It also means that our current jobs held by approximately of these 15 million workers for our Gen Z and millennials they're gonna be automated by 2030. 
So a lot of our call services, as you've already seen, have all been automated. A lot of our banking industry have been automated. How about like the telephone system when we call into the school district? That's been automated. It's replacing the human workforce with an automated workforce. So we're going to have to think differently about what we even teach in schools to prepare our kids for this futuristic world they're going to be living in. And this is what's interesting too. With even in five years, this shift is going to be from 48% human facing and 52% machine algorithm based workforce. So even in five years, you can see what's already happening. It's already changing the way that we're doing things. Even look today, we're totally teaching online. We've automated the process instead of me be coming to you in your classrooms and working with you individually or with a large group. We're doing everything online, so we're automating the learning. These statistics are coming from the Future of Work in America report, so this is where that data is coming from. Now, I have another pondering question I'd like to ask you. What jobs can you relate to that have been automated in the last five years. So think about that first, and I'm gonna give you a new prompt, the same question, but you'll be able to respond to it. So what jobs can you relate to that have been automated in the last five years? So I'm gonna give you an, a new prompt that again, you can add the text to instantly. Okay, so that's gonna refresh your page. Now you have the prompt on the left, and now you have your answers on the right. So tell me what you've seen in your workplace environment, whether it's school, whether it's business, whether it's administration. What have you seen that has changed your life, we'll say for good? What's been automated? So I'll be patient and I'll wait and I'll be quiet just for a few more seconds. Okay, I have seven out of 14 responses in that I can see from my teacher end of things, which is great. So keep plugging away. Give me some examples. Even give me an example that, that you may have not thought of before, but it's like, wow, that has been automated. I didn't think of it like that. Okay, I have about two thirds of you that have responded. So I'm gonna show the responses. Please continue to respond. I'd love to see your responses. Okay, when I see the responses on my end right now, what I'm seeing, cashiers has been an example. Shopping, right? Shopping online for sure. Everything we're doing is shopping. You know, it's been very easy, right? To shop on Amazon or other big providers and have it delivered directly to our house. I still do all of my grocery shopping online. I can have it delivered to my home or I can go and wait in a secured line that when I go like to Sprouts is our one of our um, my favorite organic food stores that we go to and they come outside. I pop my trunk of my car. They don't even have to touch anything. They put the bags in and then I can shut the trunk of my car and away I drive off. So I don't have to interact with anybody about fearing of getting sickness or um or having to be in con close contact with someone. Banking, online shopping, insurance assessors, yes. Newspaper reporters, yes. Um, food delivery, I see our, our teacher friends still typing. I can see as you go. That's what's the beauty of this. From my end, I can see everything. Bank tellers, cashiers at McDonald's. You know, this is correct. I went into a McDonald's probably prior to COVID I was not even greeted by anybody. They had a big touch interactive board. I could choose my dollar coffee. That's all I wanted and a, a glass of water. And by the time I did that, I can pay all online. I went basically to the counter and I was provided a cup and I would go take care of myself. So very little interaction with human, with any humans. Uh, yeah, lemonade uses. <laughs> okay. Insurance agents, lemonade uses, all AI. Yes. Absolutely. Um, artificial intelligence is what that AI is standing for. Drone delivery services. We are seeing more of that. 
ordering at restaurants, yes, picking up pizza to go and other things. Food preparation, ordering online, yes, everything's going to be delivered by robots, isn't it? We have a, an area out here in Arizona, and the town is called Tempe, Arizona. They're creating new neighborhoods where no cars are going to be allowed. You can use bicycles, but on the outskirts of this community is where you can pick up your Lyft or your Uber. But they are going to be having robots doing all their deliverables in the inside. So they're doing a massive test with us right now. And they're trying to keep it just human interface, but then the robotics deliver all of their goods. Okay, thanks everybody. I see more of you are sharing. This is wonderful. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, as we continue on with all of these responses, this is what we have to do for high school teachers, especially and administrators and individuals that are even in the business sector that will be working with high schools. We have to offer more future proofing strategies to empower our kids to think differently and adapt to be more flexible when it comes to their next career that they choose to be part of. That really means that their mindsets, we have to prepare them for quick adaptability. We have to allow them to fail, but then think about what I need to do to change more quickly and then adapt on the fly. But that means we as educators have to model the adaptive emotional intelligent mindset and that we don't give up, we have to persevere. We have to show what perseverance looks like because our high school kids sometimes give up too easy and just say, I can't do it or I give up. We have to show them what perseverance is for them to understand how to persevere. We also need to demonstrate very actively how to listen with intent and to think critically and then to respond with understanding. And we need to also build this all around a design thinking strategy based on empathy-based communication and collaboration so that we understand and can have a conversation and a critical debate without getting so upset with one another or walking away mad. We have to work through those strategies with our kids. But we have to put at the foremost of everything that learning is a continuum a continuous process and we are lifelong learners because our children will no longer go to work at a place of an industry or educational field for 30 years. That is of the past. Our kids will be re -ramp or ramping up and revitalizing and changing and shifting jobs of what they do every five years. So that's a lot of thinking differently of how to prepare our kids for the future workforce. Again, this is coming from the world economic. Some other things that we know that are working well, and I had a teacher friend online already today that mentioned this. When we can present information to kiddos right now in small, snackable, bite-sized chunks of information, they process that information more quickly they can apply it more quickly, but then they also will ask more questions when they don't understand instead of not asking a question at all. We also need to allow for more choice and sensory learning modalities. What that means, sitting and getting to a lecture is no longer going to be. If we're introducing new content, it should be at the most five to seven minutes of new content, and then kids should be applying, processing, reflecting or sharing information with students as a team, like a dynamic duo or a transformative trio in small groups. We need to allow our kids to make, do, and tinker more often. Our kids are very tactile. They learn through visuals, they learn through hands-on, they learn through seeing and listening. So we need many learning modalities. As we have already seen, when I talk with high school kids, they usually watch it first. They want a video clip to learn. Then they want to demonstrate or apply. They want to touch, interact, break it apart, and then put it back together. And then they want to create something new from it. And what I've always found when I allow for those smaller chunks for them to process, to create, and make, that's when the questioning comes out. That's when they're willing to lead and peer mentor. And that's when they're willing to have more critical discussions and going deeper into the content that we're presenting. And that has really worked for me as a teacher when I work with high school teachers and high school students. And when I talk with the high school kids, this they want. Smaller is better at this right now. And we need to do it in smaller chunks for them to dive deeper into the content. 
Now, a few other things that most of our kids have said they liked, but we still have some children that will say, I, there are times I just want to work alone. We need to respect that. There needs to be individual work time too. But collaborative group works are the new norm. Business leaders, they want individuals to be able to work in collaborative groups, to actively listen, to understand, and to create something that's so powerful that we never would have thought of all by ourselves. And that's why it's important that kids are gaining diverse learning perspectives from all different cultures and ethnic groups, because everybody has an experience to bring to the table. And how we've all learned is different, and we can gain meaningful information by the by diverse collaborative group networks. Um, as you probably already know, choice of personalized learning pathways really works well too. You could still springboard it from your standard you must cover or the content you must cover, but we need to have some choice in that as a subtopic that could complement that main topic. We also need to include more passion-based interest projects and that will hook your kids right from the beginning. Even though, again, that we must cover the standard of this concept, there should be choice as a subtopic that branches off that always leads back to the main topic. Then the children see the purpose, the purpose in the learning. Here's a few other things I wanted to share with you, too, and you probably have already discovered this. But these kids love to design and make more than any other generation that I've found. And when I work with middle school kids, it's almost replica of what the high school kids are asking and wanting because they want to have ownership in their learning. And it is, if you can make your activities moving forward, allowing to have your kids to think like an entrepreneur and then design like an engineer, they will love you for a lifetime. And if you can make it real and wow worthy with a real world cause and a purpose, they're going to feel that they're a solutionist and, and actually are contributing to a greater world of good. That's why it's important. So we have to allow these kids to be active participants and leaders in these global solutions because they are going to be here much longer than we are. And they don't want to go through another world pandemic. So we need to allow them to lead and to help solve for this pandemic now so that we don't go through this struggle again in the future. So I want some learning feedback now. And as you can see, I'm continuously mo modeling today. Even within my five to seven minutes of new content, I always pause to reflect so that you can process and connect those learning dots. So this is the strategy I use, especially with high school kids, to retain their attention, to allow them to process, and then they own that learning. So the question I want you to think about before I refresh the screen is, of that new content that I just gave you about Generation Z, how they learn, how they work, how they want to create and make, could you summarize? I have two interesting points of what you found most interesting or at least one point of interest. So what I'll do is I'm gonna add a new prompt instantly and I'm gonna give you that text playback again. So now it's refreshed. You're gonna see the screen that you could enter your answer. I also with Pear Deck, I could have played it back that you could enter a numeric playback. You could do a drawing. Um, you could also do a drag and drop entry if I had it set up that way. And I love this because it gives different types of authentic assessment immediately that I'm getting feedback. And then all of this information is collated for me as a teacher to continue to further look back on and see where the kids connected the learning dots and where they were challenged in their thinking and who I need to connect with if they're not getting it or if something did not stick with them. Okay. So even if you can just give me one interesting point about Generation Z and the kids that you're currently working with as you influence them each day, what did you find most interesting? Or is there something that you could now take that main point of view and put it into perspective into a new lesson idea to use tomorrow? And I'll just pause. I'll try to be quiet so you can process. Okay, I have about two thirds of you responding at this time, which is great. I'm gonna showcase uh, the representation of my answers that I have so far. 
Um, I also see that some of you have said you're going to put into best practice that no more to five to seven minutes of new content per day or lesson. Yeah, per that activity in particular, then give them time to tinker and play, but also reflect. Reflection is really key. They even say right now students should be reflecting up to 40 minutes per day. That's where the research is at, especially for our high school kids, that they are reflecting on that learning to solidify those ideas. Absolutely. Great statement, teacher friend, that you made. Yeah, lessons and activities should be geared toward entrepreneurial spirit. There should be more of what can they contribute to a greater world of good. It, you know, it's interesting. Our kids are going to be these future solutionists that they're going to create these just overarching big tasks that they're going to solve for. And it's like, I want to see it. I want, I want to inspire them to do so much more. I, yeah, have the students create a PSA or mobile apps. Oh, you're spot on. I love what you're saying. This is excellent. Excellent. Yeah, isn't it something that Gen Z also learns towards more opinions and advice from adults? But as long as we keep modeling and inspiring our students with what those careers can look like, we can still bring in experts through Skype. We could bring them in through also Microsoft Teams or a type of webinar interface. They still want to learn with experts, but sometimes they don't always want to listen to experts. But we've got to find what that niche is for them. Absolutely. You know, I, I love that idea, too, that Gen Z truly needs a UDL to be successful. Yeah. They need, we need to really do a backwards design concept. What is the learning outcome? What is the purpose here? How is it meaningful to our kids? We've got to really think differently of how we design our lessons and activities. Yes. Chunking five minutes fits with free screencastify time limit. Spot on, teacher friend. That's right. They even say videos right now should even be about three minutes. But five minutes will keep the kids' attention spans good. Yeah, the important role, the creativity is the part of the students too. Creativity is everything right now. Kids want to create something to showcase that learning. We have to build that in. It's no longer sit and get for any of us, even as teachers. So teacher friends, thank you for sharing um, that. That was absolutely amazing. I'm going to hide those responses right now. We're going to continue on. And now I'm going to give you some strategies to add to your digital toolbox. And do you know what? I've got so so many strategies here. I could talk about this for a week. So in case we don't get through everything, just know that you have full access to this presentation that you're going to get everything, no matter what. Okay, let's look at some life skills for our kids. If you haven't tapped into this site, this is phenomenal. This is really future ready focused for our kids and to help them guide and model what is next in their life. And this site is called Invest in What is Next. I like this because it has kids really take on a persona or a role that if they want to choose just to say a certificate program or an associate degree, and then they choose a career path in marketing or social brand marketing, what does that look like? How much will it cost me, first of all? How much will it provide for me as a paycheck monthly? Um, what are my cost of living that if I start out on my own, getting my own apartment or my flat that I'm in, you know, how much is that going to cost? How will it balance with my budget for my groceries, my electricity, everything like that? And then what are my future gains? What's it going to look like for that degree in five years from now? This is something to really get your kids thinking about a career focus. And I love it because it's so student centered. Again, invest in what's next.org. Another one, this is by far my favorite. I use this with a lot of upper middle school students and high school students. This is called careervillage.org. You as a teacher can go in and set up a profile and you can add in your students. And within this portal, these are where major corporations, educational institutions, big, big corps too like NASA, um, health industry, tech fields from Intel to Dell to HP, startup companies like Wonder Workshop, Ozobots, um, you name it, they're in here. But these are individuals that are mentoring upper middle school, high school, and college degree individuals. This is a site for students to ask questions in a very safe and ethical and moderated environment and it helps kids identify 
a more of a pursuit of their passion of a career that they're interested in, what types of classes they should take, what does the career focus look like for longevity in five or 10 years, what it, what's other advice of what other courses or certificates should I earn if I'm interested in a field. I help a lot of students in here that when the hashtag comes in as like women in leadership, um, girls in STEM, mentoring, role modeling, things like that. I have a lot of those questions that come in. So each morning, if there's a tag that comes into my portal, because I sign up as a volunteer to mentor in here, I answer those questions in the morning and give sound advice and supportive resources to students. And these are from children from all over the world. So this is another site to help get your kids really on track. Another one, if you haven't seen during this pandemic, they have a huge collection that are free, and then there are paid for courses. But Coursera um, is a great portal for students to really define their interest, pursue their passions, and take part in these courses even before they go off onto a tech degree, for your college degree, or right into the business workforce. I also have a collection for you that I have designed and wrote an ebook since March, since this pandemic. And it's called the Innovative Blended Learning Ideas ebook. And we have put together collections of just in time resources to help your students really focused on just uh, revitalizing that entrepreneurial spirit, but then at the same time, looking at job potentials and what the market looks like futuristically. So I've got ideas in here to help your students be part of the bigger future solutionist as part of this pandemic. We've got 3D challenges that will complement helping with the PPE. I've got a whole SEL, social emotional learning focus when it comes to helping kids reflect more often and purposeful reflections to help build that child's inner self up build confidence in their learning. So I have all of that. This is about a 28 page book right now. We continue to add to it each week, but I've got just in time learning um, and all kinds of virtual mentorships right now too. So if you're looking for mentorships for your high school kids, you can do online virtual um, mentorships as well that are there or internships for your students. So another activity like I'd like to share with you, this includes literacy, social studies, the arts and foreign language. So I combine these a lot because I don't necessarily care to teach subjects areas very separately. And I know in high school we do that a lot, but when we can blend in a multidisciplinary approach for high school, the kids see how the learning connects together more cohesively and it has more meaning to the students. So if you haven't tapped into this site, this is called kidlit.tv. It is brilliant. They have a lot for elementary, middle school, and then they have a smaller section for high school. But what I like about for the high school is that these are authors and illustrators that will read aloud passages of stories that are for high school kids. And then they have pause and reflect moments. And these most of the books that are there really allow the students to empathize with the characters in the book of understanding, you know, how our history has come to be. Like for this particular one, this is uh, this is called Village of Scoundrels, and what happened kind of during the era when we when we were talking about um, the Holocaust and how parents had to hide their children and where the children were during this time, and then what happened to these children when they're at the high school level. So it really allows children to understand a different perspective of a time that they did not know about and how they had to survive during this time. So this is just so amazing. So I hope you can tap into this. What I normally do is that I have a small video clip that you can watch, which is like five minutes long. And then from there, students can respond. And once again, this is where Pear Deck comes in. So this is just a screenshot of one of the Pear Decks that I can include. So if I have the students watch a five minute video clip of story makers, then I would have the students respond to what message do you think the author is trying to convey? And then from there, the kids could instantly respond. And then I can see if they made that learning connection with that novel that we were reading. 
I could also have my students continue on and then consider different viewpoints and really take on that empathy role of understanding the emotional tone, the perspective, and that point of view from that particular character. So again, these are all pre-made slides that are in Pear Deck, and then you can change out any of the visuals that you want to make them more elementary, middle school, or high school appropriate is what you'd like. Another one that I want to share with you in high school, if you're not reading aloud to your kids, you need to do so. Our kids love to be read aloud to. Many of you know that it's a common practice in elementary. It's a common practice in middle school. But for some reason, some teachers don't. We know that some of you do, but some teachers don't do read alouds. Our students that struggle with the different Lexile reading levels and the ability to read and understand complex text, you know, that's a challenge for them. And then they shut everything down sometimes because they don't understand. But when you can read aloud the complex text or from a no novel to complement what you're teaching in your classroom, that's an instant hook, line, and sinker for your high school kids. If you ask your high school kids, they said they love to be read to. And not only do kids love to be read to, we should be offering this opportunity that kids should be hearing reading at least 30 minutes, if not 60 minutes a day in some capacity. And we should allow our students to be reading as well. And why not have your students do read alouds with other students? So I know sometimes that might be a perception for some kids. Maybe they might feel embarrassed, but helping that build that confidence up is a real life skill for speaking. And we need to address that so kids' voice can be heard. This is called the World Read Aloud Day. If you haven't tapped into this, this is a high school teacher that reads aloud every single day in his class with his students, that he ties in art and literature and mathematics and science, everything to make their world come alive with the content that he's presenting in their classroom. I'd always follow up then also, let's say if I did a read aloud with a book, I could also follow up to say, what conclusions do you draw from the information of why a high school teacher should read aloud in class to their students? So this would be another type that the kids could respond and reflect. And again, kids should be reflecting and writing at least 40 minutes a day in some capacity. It doesn't mean nonstop 40 minutes. It means those smaller snackable content chunks of writing to connect the learning dots. A few other things if you haven't tapped into, the Google Arts and Culture is a really creative way for students to pursue their passions of what they're interested in. We do not include the arts and our culture enough in what we teach. And it's such a great compliment to science, math, literature, social studies, and foreign language. And if you haven't been to Google Arts and Culture in a while, you need to tap into this. This is phenomenal because it blends as a multidisciplinary approach, taking from the old world to our new world and futuristically of where this is all going. And it also gives a very interesting perspective to high school students of every student is really a creative artist and their artist skills is reflective of whether it's voice, whether you're using a different type of medium, whether you're really into writing a piece of literature, whether you're really into designing and matching, making and sculpting and painting, or whether it's designing media sets through music and sound and, and video. You know, all of us are an artist. Sometimes those dreams are stifled um, they love it in elementary. Our kids always say when you ask them, I want to be an artist when I grow up. If you get to the middle school, the kids don't say that as much because all of a sudden their art is now really heavily reviewed as not being as good as they maybe had liked it in elementary years. We've got to bring the arts and culture back to life for our middle school and high school kids. And every child it has this inner artist within them. It's just in different art forms. And we've got to find what is that passion of their art form to come through, which could also complement their career focus. I just wanted to share this with you. Some teacher friends have really jumped on the Bitmoji, Bitmoji craze. If you haven't seen this, this is phenomenal. I love working with foreign language teachers and art teachers in particular, and they are creating their own art galleries in which that they will do an art challenge of the week 
They also will do deeper investigations of an artist of the week, a different type of technique or a medium that they use, and the kids are loving it. So this is actually an interactive slide deck, which can be created in Google Slides or can be created in Microsoft PowerPoint and totally interactive that the kids have a choice to learn, to listen to a video clip. Then they go to the artist of the week to read and then they reflect on that and then they relate it to themselves personally of how they could apply it to their own lives. So I thought this was a really creative way that this teacher is getting kids really actively engaged. Another way, here's a foreign language teacher. She has set her room up to try to replicate what her classroom looks like, even though during remote learning, you can, you can see that she's got a love for kitty cats. She's got two cats on her couch, so she's made her room really comfy. But at the same time too, what she does is in her picture windows, she has a picture to drive the story, and then she has an interactive activity in which they are practicing another language and getting critical feedback. So that's what's really intuitive about this one. A slide deck that can be included, Pear Deck also has things to promote and to help students practice foreign language. So if you, if you didn't know about that, you can ask a question and you can add an image and you can add and insert the language that you're practicing. And then the students will respond back and reflect in that language as well too. That's what I really like about this. So Pear Deck has so many slides to complement each and every subject area and especially at the high school level. Now, some other things I'd like to share with you, and I know our time is kind of coming to an end, but if you haven't tapped into education protocols, this is a win-win for all of you. This works for every single grade level, every single subject area, and it really empowers kids to work with dynamic teams of duos or trios. So you're going to say, well, Naomi, what's an education protocol? Well, an edu protocol, basically, it's just an instructional lesson frame, or we call it that framework but it's set up to help kids be successful, be truly engaged in a topic, but it really empowers kids to critically think, they have to collaborate, they have to share, they have to communicate, and then they showcase their creativity. It's amazing. So what I like about these curriculum frames that you use for education protocols is that even if you're an art teacher or a science teacher or a foreign language teacher or a math teacher, you can still use your standard that you need to meet. And then you create and design your lesson frame around this protocol. And the protocol always remains consistent. It's just the content is what changes. And again, it can be used in any subject or any grade level. So let me share with you kind of an example. I did include a video clip that's here that you can watch after the fact, because I just knew that we wouldn't have enough time. It's a brief one minute video clip. But this is one that's called a cyber sandwich. And we know that when we're instructing with kids that smaller is better. So we talked about the smaller snackable chunks, but you know, a sandwich has many layers. It's like a scaffolding technique. And this helps kids break down complex text and complex subject matters into smaller pieces that is more manageable for them. So I wanna make sure that you've got all kinds of templates here, teacher friends. So um, John Karipko, great teacher friend uh, from Q, um, the Q organization in California, he's got a collection here. And if you go to eduprotocols.com slash free dash templates, there's a whole collection that you can tap into that work beautifully with Microsoft PowerPoint and Google Slides. So here's an example. This is what it is. If I'm a teacher in a classroom and I have 50 minutes or 48 minutes of my period that I have with my kids, the first part is, is that I assign basically the overview of the protocol, how it works. Then the students read actually for up to 10 minutes. So they're reading, processing, and applying. Then they meet with a student friend and they share their understanding of the reading. They reflect on what they both know. And then they can write as a final conclusion independently. So there's a moment that they read independently. They come together. They team their ideas, they reflect on what they've learned, they process that information, and then independently they write and they, ind they write uh, independently. And that allows for me to know that did that content stick? What did they learn together? How did they work together as a team? So here's an example. If I gave the students a passage to read, they would read that. And then within that 10 minutes, each student would have their own slide within PowerPoint. They would then reflect and basically take notes. 
the main points of interest, the how and the why and the because, and they would reflect on that. Then the next 10 minutes, kids come together. Then they get a slide that's got looks like a trifold. Then they can add their main ideas down on each slide and what they have in common goes in the middle. Then they can see what they are they independently found, then together they make better, stronger conclusions. They talk about perceptions, but then they justify, they go back to the reading to say, hey, here's the proof. This is why we are on the same page and this is why it's similar. Then from there, what they do, they can add in media, they can add in video clips to state their proofs. So this particular one was, was called the attack on Pearl Harbor. And that was an event uh, that took place in the United States back in the 1940s. And what happened during that time as you know, the bombing of Pearl Harbor um, started one of our most devastating wars in our lifetime. And because of that, the kids are now doing a comparison. We've got uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor, and now we're doing a comparison of the attacks on 9-11. So now kids have two justifiable life events that took place. What was similar? What is different? And then they combine those efforts. So that, that really puts perspective for kids because they weren't alive during the attack of Pearl Harbor. But many of them could be alive during the attacks of 9-11, and that's most relevant. But they can see how history is very similar and how sometimes it's repeating itself. Okay. And then, whoops, sorry. And then from there, what we would do um, students would have that final slide that they'd independently reflect, and I could see the learning that took place from that deeper conversation. You're getting through the content more quickly, the kids are having deeper, meaningful conversations, and then they've got a final product to justify where they're at. So education protocols, that's one out of many, and I think you'll absolutely love it. The other things that I wanted to share case with you, we mentioned earlier the Bitmojis. I, I can't say enough, but making activity extraordinary out of the every, everyday ordinary, that's where we need to go. We have the opportunity right now, teacher friends, to reinvent education. I know that things sometimes haven't gone well with remote teaching and learning, but we've learned from that. Now we need to rise above and take out the best one, two, or three things that have really worked well with kids and move forward of what we can do. This particular example that I have here, this is a virtual PE classroom. So my high school teachers that are with me today, if you're doing health, PE, wellness, and social emotional learning, we need to make that interactive too. This is an interactive choice board, believe it or not, in a slide deck so that when kids come here, they can read, they can see what they need to do. They interact and touch what they need to do. There's interactive stations in the back that pop out and come to life that kids can do challenges at home. They can pick up the basketball and that will give them a design task of what to do with the basketball. There's a bike. It's going to tell them if you've got a bike, you can go out and do this. And then I've got a girl down here. She's playing tennis. What you can do that even if you don't have a partner to play tennis with, and then we're going to talk about lifting weights and repetitions. It's really a lot of fun. So the kids are having choice and that's what they love about it, but they're still working out. On the side I have LinkedIn, it says, we are teachers Bitmoji classroom examples coming from the Bitmoji craze on Facebook, and then how to get started with creating your own Bitmoji classroom to make it as an interactive choice board. A few other things that if you haven't seen, these are just examples. I've got a teacher friend that's actually in third grade. She created a game day because she loves sports. So she, keeps, she creates everything around a sports themed activity, but still includes everything that she needs. I've got other teachers that have more of a decluttered classroom and they introduce one thing at a time and they focus on that and go deeper into that. On the very bottom, the very bottom right, that's a classroom that has a paraprofessional and a speech pathologist um, that that student works with. And what I love about this is that not only do they see their teacher, they see the speech pathologist and then they see the paraprofessional. It's not changed. They have the support mechanisms that are there. They have interactive choice books that they can read. They can choose from the other uh, bookshelf. They can choose and to do other examples. But make it fun. Make it interactive. Kids want the choice, but also make them be responsible. Have them reflect and, and write and give voice feedback, too, in any of your lessons that you're doing. So a few last minute things. I've got so much, like I said, if you're looking for real world math, here are some great activities. This one's called Actuary Foundation and the Actuarial Foundation will allow for you to do, do design thinking real world challenges. It includes sports, it includes going to the mall, it includes music, it includes plan, save and succeed, how to buy your first 
uh, electric car, and so on. Some other things, if you haven't seen, how about having students design their own math games? Especially what we now know at the high school level, the complex math that you have is preparing them for their world. Why not have kids design and engage their own board game with your math standards that you must include and have them create a game board around that and make it real life about their community? If you haven't seen this, this is called Instructables. These are design challenges, especially made for middle school, high school, and college students. This is real life taking everyday objects and turning them into beautiful projects to solve a real world problem. There's anything out there from coding, robotics, artificial intelligence, science, math, foreign language, you name it. Everything is out there. Making, baking, it's all there. So it's called instructables.com. These are other bits of pieces of information from Paradeck that when you're offering math and science courses that you can still include that if they have to graph a problem that instantly this can be shared out and each student right away can graph their solution and I as a teacher can see it back in Paradeck. You can also ask ongoing questions. And I also have my last one of our science ideas and these are coming from Paradeck too. I can label, I can mark up, I can do this as an authentic assessment. That's what I love about this. I can actually have my kids claim evidence and reason about a topic. I can have an interactive period table or my periodic table of elements fill in information. So if I have blank elements, fill that in and what those elements are and how they affect our earth. I could have my kids do making real world connections, put a main concept in and then have them differentiate and explain the differences of comparison and contrasting. And I also have all kinds of other real world challenges. If you haven't seen Curiosity Machine, this is another one. Everything STEM related and artificial intelligence related. This is where our children can be a solutionist to be part of our future for good. So I love it because it includes everything from building a planting machine that if you're on the farm, building and creating your own circuit to work with electric engineering, uh, designing a sample aircraft and then associations with Boeing and NASA, and then also creating, it's called making a nano stamp. And this is just a very, very small picture of what is included on this. You're gonna love it. So tap into that one for sure. Lastly, as we wrap up, if you haven't had an opportunity, please invite experts into your classroom. Kids, even though we are an expert in what we teach, we need to invite creative expertise in from experts because children still love to learn from others in a different dynamic way. So Skype a scientist is absolutely phenomenal. So kids get a better perspective of how these doctors and scientists and nurses actually are impacting our world and what the possibilities of a career choice and pathway can be for your high school students. So I can't thank you enough. I know it was a power packed hour. I appreciate your critical feedback and also that your constructive feedback and how you provided um, examples that you shared with connecting with the content that we shared today. So if you would like to um, continue on with this conversation. I do have the link here for today's presentation. I have it as a tinyurl.com slash HS remote learning. Once you gain access to this full presentation, you've got access to the Innovative Blended Learning Ideas book. I've got more examples for K-12 Blueprint if you're looking for remote learning. I have two more slides for that yet. And then I've got some remote learning guides from ASCD that if you're looking for more, especially just for high school. So included, I have co-wrote with Paige Johnson and a team of amazing women teachers from around the country. These are remote learning resources for parents that by support of Intel Education, we have put the best practices together to help parents and to help you as teachers for these kids during this time. And it has an special creative focus on social emotional learning, but this includes every single subject area and it includes high school. So I wanna let you know, I've got all kinds of free resources here for you. I also have this great website that if you haven't seen this open educational resources, this is called Wide Open School. Wide Open School includes everything for remote teaching and learning by grade level. So you'll see elementary, middle school, and high school. And then also 
um, great support for English language learners and uh, special education or our children with differing abilities as well too. If you're wanting to know more about Generation Z and the impact from this coronavirus that we're in, I have two more video clips I included. This is coming from CBSN, and this one's also coming from Meet Gen Alpha, the next generation, that if you're going to be working with the littles eventually someday, this is really quite intuitive of how these kids are going to be the game changers even beyond Generation Z. So I cannot thank you enough for joining today. I'm going to pull this presentation back at this time, and I'm gonna come back to our main slide deck so I can see each and every one of you kind of where we're at today. And I'll bring this back up. So I will stop sharing the slide deck so that I can see each of you, okay? And if you have questions at this time, I can hang on for a few more minutes so that if you have anything, so. Yes, you'd like me to share the um, the URL again? Absolutely, teacher. Well, hello, Susan, my friend. I absolutely have missed you this week. I've been off for about 10 days. I took a break. I needed a, I needed a brain break, right? Okay, let me see if I get this back in here correctly. There we go. There is the main master slide again for you. Let's see if it comes up. Oh, thank you so much. There it is again. Okay, absolutely. There is my beautiful teacher friend as well. Is, is it Mary Monique? Yeah, full name is Mary Monique Shaw, but I, either will go. <laughs> I just, I love your name. It's so beautiful. I just love it. Yeah. <laughs> thank yeah. you. Okay, I talked a mile a minute, teacher friends. I'm so sorry, but I wanted to give you the world again. So, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. But it, it, Susan or Mary or anyone else that's online, anyone, ask any questions. If I don't know the answer, I will go to my teacher friends. I'll find it out and we can help each other with it. So, okay. Um, well, my question's more just getting your opinion because we, okay. um, my district is going to go 100%. We found out last night at the board meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but we were... We're in Northern California, so West Contra Costa has a goal plan to provide like a hub for families, not just, you know, uh, like a study hall support, but also looking at food and other resources you mm -hmm. know, to, to be in the, uh, in the uh, site. So I really, really like the idea because we do have kids that, yeah, we're going 100%, you know remote learning, but they really need that support. And just to have our school site to do that, um, that would be awesome. But I just wanted to hear your ideas of, are there um, other models that you heard of or um, anything that you see that may work that you think is a great idea? Well, you know, that's a really open-ended question because everybody's kind of defining and creating their space right now. Yeah. And, I did, <laughs> and I did hear California, I think most of your whole state is going to be totally remote learning to start with because the pandemic and your numbers have skyrocketed. We mm -hmm. are in Arizona. Our numbers are off the chart. And I'm so sad to say that it's just off the charts. Um, I'm, I'm afraid that's what's going to happen here too. Um, what we are seeing and what we're hearing from community, from parents, um, from teachers on the forefront, social emotional learning and trauma has got to be prioritized no matter what. We've mm -hmm. got to find the best balance for our kids that actually less is more. But I think we can really go deeper with the main concepts. Even though our, stu our teachers have this amazing curriculum, you can still use your same curriculum, but you may want to cut back on part of that. You can't just keep pushing and pushing because the kids are going to be turned off. We need to go more deeper with the curriculum, choose a theme, more theme approach that also includes a focus of community. Mm -hmm. It includes um, kids having more of a personal choice, like a subtopic I mentioned earlier on, that they feel that they have some ownership in what they can then contribute. Because um, I know, let's say, our teachers that teach chemistry, right? Chemistry is really important. We find chemistry all around our world. Chemistry can be included in our baking of what we create and make. It includes of all of our elements of our earth and how things interact. We've got to find a way to personalize that for kids to make it more meaningful. And to do that, we've got to bring in real world elements. I would also say to give teachers a better balance, 
we should be bringing in a guest speaker at least once a week. Teachers, not to say that they need a break, we need to bring different voice. So children know that we can learn from others and there's credible individuals that are out there that we can learn from them. Yeah. And actually it could really just elevate the level of learning and excitement in your classroom right yes, now. Yes, definitely. Make it relevant to, you know, to see yeah. the application of their learning. So that's yes. great. I, I was just curious about your pin. So I really appreciate yeah. sharing that. And yes, social emotional, um, that's the big thing because we, yeah. we don't even know what trauma they they are bringing in and so building the community focusing on that relationship building is great we talked about teachers looping with their students so those teachers that had the students last mm -hmm. year kind of go on with them um, it's a little difficult with high school because different topics but you know we're right. looking at elementary school and right school. but what what i heard you say susan i heard the word looping i was a fourth mm -hmm. fifth grade looping teacher but think about the beauty even at your high school. Your high school teachers know even better. Some of them have formed those beautiful relationships with those children. Mm -hmm. If there's even a way that teachers between common areas can loop and build together, now more than ever, I mentioned, we need to reinvent education. And this is where our high school teachers should be partnering up. It can be our science teacher with our literature yes. teacher. Mm -hmm. It could be our math can be with our foreign language we should find a better way to make those subjects blend more because mm -hmm. kids kids see them interacting together. When they graduate, they don't see math as separate, mm -hmm. science as separate. And totally agree. I think that's where high school needs to be revamped. It really, yeah. really does. Well, I was kind of talking to my principal about partner teaching. Yeah. I love it, love uh, it. At first it was, it was more like job alike teach, mm -hmm. you know, and then they kind of, you know, take it on because we're doing remote so they can do that um, but I do think it's important to first like you said the social emotional and then dealing with yep. the trauma I mean we, we basically we're kids are coming in we don't even know the trauma that sh they're, they're coming in with at this point so it's really looking at screening because so we're doing a we develop a reopening plan in terms of the social emotional um, we're still in preliminary steps. We really need to get it together, but I've been working with my wellness coordinator on that. Sure. But we're looking at the screening. How okay. do we screen for, you know, uh, trauma and also social emotional needs? Yeah, and that's, um, do you know there's a site that's called, I gotta remember what it's called. Oh, it's called 60 something. I have to remember yeah. what it is, but it's, it's SEL. You know what? If you can just hang on with me just for a minute, let me, I'll get it for you. Okay, awesome. And, and it's really good that it includes the bigger focus of social emotional learning. Um, it's called 60 Second Something. I, um, it's okay. I'm, I know. And so also, much. I wanted to add um, hi, Susan. Hi. Um, I w as you were sitting there um, talking about discussing that, I was, I, I'm, you live out in California, so you may be more familiar with um, um, uh, ACE with Dr. Nadine Burke. Uh, yeah, the, you're talking about Average Childhood. Uh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So perhaps um, I know right now I haven't checked during this time, uh, but perhaps they may have something to screen for trauma since that's essentially what they what they yeah. deal with. I was looking at the California plan, the recommendation, mm -hmm. uh, Department of Education. They they talked about screening. So I was like trying to find out, well, what what screening tools do you recommend? Because they, mm -hmm. they do recommend for us to screen so we know. Mm -hmm. um, but I think uh, we're just kind of piecing it together. We're also looking at, you know, trying we're asking other districts, see what they're doing too, you know? So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a lot of uh, collaborating, I think, and just trying to uh, get resources for our students. Right, yeah. I put in the back channel chat, I'm sure you're familiar with it, but CASEL, CASEL is the main framework oh. for SEL, and they have a okay. new tool, they've got a new toolkit. There is another one that's built into that as well too. Um, gosh, I. I it's just slipping me at 60 seconds, I, but, but I can follow I, up uh, with you. Castle, uh, I went, I, I attended their webinar. So okay. uh, they talked about it, but I didn't 
I might have missed the beginning, so I'll, I'll take okay. a look at it, see if they had any screening tools. But it was sponsored, I think, Castle and Kaiser. I think so. Together. You're, yeah. co you're correct. And they do have a new toolkit. So when you go to that link, okay. there'll be, there's going to be a toolkit right there. Um, That's good to know. Oh, yeah. Somebody else needs the... Let me see if I can share this back in here. The other thing, what I heard you say, Susan, is the amount, the, the type of trauma that our students are going to be coming back with. Um, I had a, a really, really interesting conversation with a teacher just the other day on types of trauma. We think that, well, the kids have been away for remote teaching and learning, and that's trauma enough. What I think what some teachers and individuals are not understanding, we have students that have lost grandparents, that have lost their own parents, they have been relocated now, that mom and dads have lost jobs. Um, students, mm -hmm. of, because of their race, their nationality, their ethnic orientation, have dis been discriminated against. And just, I, I've just been so appalled by the type of, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I despise the word hate. And it's, it's our children have been hated upon because of who they are. Mm -hmm. We've got to build these kids back up and let them know that, yes, you matter. You are worth it. You are the diversity that each and every child brings is a gift. Mm -hmm. yes. Their ethnicity is a gift. That's yes. how we learn together. And I think that's the trauma that I'm hearing from parents right now because kids are saying that they don't feel they're valued because of their skin color. I am mm -hmm. I I just I could just cry right with them. And it's like we're mm -hmm. all so different. No, we have to appreciate you are a gift. So we've got to even start there to let them know that they need to feel comforted. They yes. need to know that we're there for them. They need to know that they're worth it. They're valued and they're so respected. Mm -hmm. We have we have to help them so emotionally right now. Definitely, yeah. I agree. Um, yeah. It's that's the first. I think you know Maslow hierarchy of needs first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. I get, I get, I'm so passionate about that because sometimes I think, how dare somebody say it that way? And you know, words matter. Words matter, and it matters even when we're high school kids. It doesn't. It's not the difference between elementary and high school. Words matter and affect us for a lifetime. And it's almost like I think we need a whole dedicated curriculum and coursework for social emotional learning. Mm -hmm. We've we've had it all along, but now it's come to the forefront that we've got to do something differently with our kids. And unfortunately, I you know I feel for our uh, staff. Um, there. Yes. They're now, you know, really expected to be counselors and social workers, you know. Uh, even my boyfriend, he's a math teacher. He said, um, you know, kids were in his Zoom meeting just there. Cause, and, and then that point sharing, you know, not talking about math, but mm -hmm. talking about what's going on in their lives. So right. he felt kind of unequipped to, you know, kind of support them. I mean, he wants to be there, but, you know, it's like. He's like, I don't know. I, I said, you know, refer the, per, uh, the student to the counselor. But, you know, sometimes kids feel safe. The, yeah. the classrooms that they, you know, are schools and classrooms were the, um, the, their safe place. And I, it was taken from them. So right, we yeah. need to kind of continue to provide that safe space for them, you know, yeah. virtually at this point. Yeah. In, just so you know, in Pear Deck, that we interacted with today with our Microsoft PowerPoint. Um, they have a whole SEL focus and they have all kinds of templates and all of the questions are in there that you can revi you revise according to what you want, but they have templates and templates and you can use whatever you want. I love it because it always integrates at the beginning, midstream and at the end that you're checking on the well-being of the child. And again, like you could see, I can totally do it anonymously or I can invite children in, but the kids are not seeing everybody else's response. Mm -hmm. And that feedback for me, that if I had a child right away that says, I'm not doing very well, Mrs. Harm, I can immediately, when we're done teaching, I can make a personal phone call to that child mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. check in. So for me, this tool of Paradoc helps personalize and puts that human touch and tone on it that okay. I can. And I think we, know. we've got to check in every single day with these kids. Otherwise, we're going to lose them. We have to. Yeah, and, and that's what we were talking about because we uh, lost a lot of kids after the school closure in terms of like not getting connected with them and not knowing what's going on. And so mm -hmm. 
we are beginning to slowly kind of figure out, piece it together. But um, I think some of our staff have remained in contact with kids. And Good. so that's great. That's definitely great. Um, to the point where uh, a teacher texts me and said, hey, are you trying to reach the student? And I said, yeah, I'm using my Google Voice to call her about her schedule. Mm -hmm. okay. And she said, um, you know, uh, she's like, OK, I'll let her know because she was worried. She, so, so, so she had like good sense of safety, you know, like kind of like uh, awareness. But it was cute because I was like, oh, yeah, and calling Google Voice. So she didn't recognize the phone number. Right, right. But that's okay. what I've been doing, using uh, the Google Voice, calling the kids. They prefer text, but mm -hmm. I've been trying to call they just do. to talk to them right <laughs> right 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 uh -huh. i do have, i do have some teachers if the children are old enough they've set up their own circles like between marco polo or boxer mm -hmm. because oh, yes you could, boxer. you could yeah you could uh record your voice or record a brief video clip because then the kids see you they see your emotional tone mm -hmm. and they hear you and see and that's worked too for our kids what's that are the older. other one you said i know boxer yeah. but what's the other one it's called marco polo Oh, yeah, they love I that see one. that. Okay. Yeah. They love that one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Wow. Because you can leave, you can watch it in real time. I mean, even mm -hmm. my grandbabies back in um, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. she will con she'll contact me, and I know that I can't get uh -oh. to it right away. Mm -hmm. But then I see it after the fact. That's I even re cute. I I record and I read bed bedtime stories to her mm -hmm. during the day, and mm -hmm. then she can watch them at night or the next oh, day. So, that's yeah. nice. That's, yeah. Those are great ideas. Yeah. Um. It's funny because my district, all the uh, principals use Voxer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yep. But okay. I think there's a, and then they, uh, I know some, I, uh, one of uh, the um, get a, a, a sessions, they recommend a Voxer, but they said mm -hmm. there's a limit to, to the amount of people you can add on Voxer. There is, and I subscribe to the full version. I yeah. think is it twenty dollars a year? It's not. It's not that much, and yeah. I can it's have the minuscule. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. But I have groups that I belong to. So. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's what yeah. they were saying. That that that's like a big thing now. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. I use Twitter. That's how I even found out about this. I'm, I'm a Q yeah. member, and so I, okay. you know, was like, oh, this is awesome. I really mm -hmm. need to. I'm trying to. I'm still trying to gather. All these resources for my teacher you know for the sure. year and where and that is one thing that we are also talking about that we need to prepare our teachers you know because three days before school starts is mm -hmm. not enough for them to no prepare. it's not right so right. we're looking at what we can do to help mm -hmm. okay okay so. well any more other questions teacher friends no, that is all. It's always great to sit yes. and, and learn new stuff. I learned something new. I said to Susan in the chat, I learned something new every time I every day. So yep. every time I tune in. I appreciate it. And you are our regulars. They keep coming back. So I just absolutely <laughs> love it. Okay. Yes. So, okay. okay. Thank you all so right. much, Naomi. Okay. We'll see you later. Okay. All right. Bye-bye, ladies. Bye.